Hi, I'm Aiden, and you're watching Photo Learningism. Let's walk through how to achieve the knife throwing effect in Kaden Live. And if you like Kaden Live and you want to find out about best practice configuration and getting your feet underneath you for starting for using that tool, I do have a book available for $5 out there as an ebook. It's called Every Tool You Need for Content Creation for Free. And of course, includes way more than just Kaden Live. It includes a whole repertoire of tools you can use to get started on content creation. But the hard facts of setting up Kaden Live are all there. Go check it out. Again, it's $4.99, $5 US. And I really appreciate you taking a look. Thank you so much. Okay, so first part of this is this original clip here. I recorded just a simple thing on my phone, and I wanted to give the viewer enough reason to trust that what I was holding, at least at first, was a real thing. And I should probably pause right there and explain something very important. What I'm about to do is use and handle a sharp object. So I wanna make sure I put a warning out there that if you're gonna try effects like this and handle a sharp thing, you need to exercise due caution. I have handled this, this knife in my hands quite a number of times. I know how to be careful with it and use it uh, responsibly. So that is my warning to you. Use sharp objects if you must responsibly. I am not responsible for injuries that may come about um, from duplicating this concept, okay? I want you to be safe. Please do be careful if you're going to attempt things like this. So getting back into it, wanted to give enough reason to trust that the knife was real. I show it off. I pull it out of the sheath. I'm obviously handling it enough. And the next part is simulating the throw. Now, if you watch closely, I don't actually let go of it, but I'm moving very quickly to kind of help sell the effect that I am throwing it. You can watch the knife go down with me if you're watching very carefully. And what I did is I simply discarded the knife again, super carefully into a chair I had next to me off camera that received it and I could bring my hand up to further sell the effect. Let's start looking into the pieces of this so you can understand how the effect is accomplished. Okay, so first part of this is we have the knife. And to do this, I had to take some still images of my knife. There were two different shots that I ended up taking. I'll just show them both to you. One at an angle and one that was kind of head on. It was kind of necessary to have a little bit of everything, although it's always best to do planning. I was figuring this out as I go and my suggestion in coming through this would be very much decide what your shot is going to do before you get too deep into things. Uh, that affects the angle, and if you can get the angle closer when you're going to take your pictures, it saves you a whole ton of time when you're working on it later. All right, so I have the two different angles which I had to manipulate a couple different ways to catch things. I needed this one to match the length geometry and this one to match the angle with the hilt because there are shots where it shows more of a hilt, and I'll explain that later. So first shot here on this knife shot. One of the things that had to be done is I had to use a transform because it is not in the position that I would prefer. So I had to create a couple different keyframes to adjust the sizing and also to simulate that it is actually moving through the air. I did four keyframes moving through that and I'm zoomed in, I think, all the way. This is literally just about every frame that I could uh, it's moving at great speed, so you can sort of get away with some things, but again, you have to carry it through at least a little bit to make it look like it's actually going somewhere. You can see the motion track of what happens and that the blade actually changes orientation a little bit. You can also see how I cheated a little bit here and that I just inverted it uh, a bit as it was moving. And then finally, we ended up moving to a different shot altogether. This is a little bit of a challenge in that when you're going to attempt to throw a knife like this uh, virtually um kaden live does not have 3d spatial awareness it does not have triaxial awareness it only works on the x and y axes that's two dimensions and it will always rotate on a flat plane no matter what you do it won't understand that when you roll it needs to adjust the visibility and perspective of the object in accordance with its direction or what you can see. It will always only ever roll in a circle that way or this way, depending on how you animate it. So that poses some challenge. You have to do what's called pseudo 3D. You have to manipulate the object along with the rotation 
if you wanted to make a shot where you're doing this kind of throwing blade thing in slow motion where you have to see more of the rotation of the blade, I was able to just do the quick frames because it's moving very quickly. But in a slower motion shot, you may need to see more of it to make it more believable. So what you do is you start by adding a transform. I have my source image, the background's transparent, that work's already done. In a transform, there are two keyframes and I just have it rotating a full 360 degrees. That is the maximum you can do with the transform effect uh, with one filter. You could theoretically loop this uh, by cut it, copying and pasting it one after the other and then making a sequence out of it. I've covered that in a previous video. But that's one way to loop it if that's necessary. So the first part is getting the full spin. Second part is creating the perspective to make the 3D, the pseudo 3D look to it to match the direction it is flying. You would have to adjust the angle a little bit. And the way you adjust it is when you apply the effect, you have the four points, the corners, as the name implies, that you just need to drag and move to set the perspective. That's pretty intuitive. And you can do that on a keyframe level. So I could change that if the shot moves or whatever, then I can create more subsequent keyframes to match what the camera should be doing. But what's cool about this is that I can suggest that it is actually traveling in 3D space somewhat, even though it isn't. You can see how it makes it short for the middle rotation and then long again coming back out to the full span because that's what you'd be able to see from that angle. So that's one way to achieve the slow-mo look if you're looking to get into that and have to show more frames if it's traveling a longer distance or if you're going to slow down the shot to make it more believable. Moving on to the next one, things in motion are not crystal clear, so I had to throw varying degrees of blur along with it. I'm just going to take out the top one here so we don't have that distracting us. Um, so as we move, you can see how it is not crystal clear. That is the image I'm working with because it should be in motion. That's pretty accurate. Next thing is that from where I start, from where I'm actually holding it, let me just back up a frame here, the knife borrows the light of its environment, it, the, the light that it absorbs and bounces, and that's different from the photo I had taken. So I had to add a little bit of adjustment. We have to add some contrast and some brightness to play into more of the environment that we are working with a little bit. So the last piece of this is just using a mask and it's on the top of the stack because the order matters. It will process it top to bottom. And this, I wanted to be first because it's gonna supersede all the other effects underneath. I want the mask to apply to all of them. So that goes first and that helps to control what you can see. Now I could have done a rotoscoping mask here as well. I just decided to do a rectangular one just because I could just draw it up from the bottom pretty simply. There's not a lot of complex things to do. I just needed a straight line to work its way up and mask off. So that worked well enough for this. You may have to invert it depending on how you apply it, uh, which direction you want to mask off just to be aware that checkbox is there. Uh, that's a little gotcha sometimes. <laughs> All right, so moving on to the next piece, the place where it ends up. The curvature of the hilt really just did not work with what I was trying to do with the head-on shot, so I had to bring in a second shot to do what needed to be done. Now it's big high res, it kind of blurs because I took it right up next to it. I probably should have backed off a little bit, but again, it's so far away in the shot, you can't tell. Things to plan and learn from next time. <laughs> so coming into this, there's a couple of common things that are baked into it, okay? First off, we're gonna do the transform and the order, as I mentioned, it's important. It doesn't always translate to how I'm going to explain it because they it, it translates it depending on the stack, but this is how it kind of works from, from the way the effect is built. So the transform first, because this looks a little bit more like the shape and the curvature I would expect it to be after I've thrown it that far away. And just to roll out, you can kind of see that that's in the distance a bit. I did use corners here because I wanted the perspective to be corrected just a bit more. All right, so I had to apply corners. That also helps to make it just a hair smaller to fit far away as I was. I was across the room. It's it's hard to tell from the, <laughs> the shooting of this, but I was a, a pretty good distance away from that wall. So then that fits together alongside with this, where pretty much the object is thrown for the last piece of it in order to make it disappear, kind of blending between the two, what you can do with the transform is you can actually set opacity. So coming into this, you can see how opacity is zero in the final keyframe. 
That's because I am, while I'm using the motion to follow through and get up to that point, I don't want that frame to actually appear. I want to take over with this new object and use the new perspective that I've created. So that's all well and good for having the knife move across space and twist a little bit and crash where I want it to into the wall. There's some other complications though, like solid objects absorb and block light. That's a little bit tricky when you're throwing something that's supposed to be there and it actually isn't there. <laughs> so we have to put in some other things to create shadows. Now what I did over here is I took advantage of the track labeling. It just got a little bit difficult to figure out what lab what track was what. So I would suggest that be used if you're going to break it down this way. When you twist open a track, you can give the track a name and you can help keep track of what's the shadow, what's the real object and all that good stuff. Let's bring in the first shadow here. I'm going to reveal that. And let's take a look at what's here. Now this, ultimately what I did is I borrowed from the object that was already there. It's going to use almost the same motion track with a little tweaking, and I'll show you what the difference is, but it's going to borrow a lot of the same things. The blur changes a little bit. The brightness changes because it's a shadow, so you essentially have to take away all the brightness. <laughs> and I didn't bother with contrast because there's no need for it. We just simply need an object that is without brightness. We're bringing it all the way down to black. The transparency helped a little bit because it needed to blend in with its environment. Now, this shadow really only works with it kind of light is coming across the room. It's coming in through the window and it's bouncing into the room. And you can kind of get an idea from this picture frame that the shadow is over here. So when I throw this, the light kind of needs to travel along the wall a little bit. And that is what I had to do using the same motion path, but also bending it a little bit. All right, I did some changing of the keyframes to distort it some. I also had to mask out certain things because I only wanted it to appear at a certain time. And again, here, as we move through, this has to show some curvature because as you saw, it is a curved blade. This is a kukuri if you're interested to know, but it has curvature and especially when the light is hitting it at an angle, you need to show that in the shadow. Light travels in a straight line it's blurred because the object is in motion. And again, we have to kind of borrow from the fact that this is moving. We shouldn't see it clearly because it's moving that fast. So the motion track follows in and then connects with the wall, at which point we need to introduce dum -da -da, a second shadow. And of course, it's not going to follow the same perspective and rules. So we have to give it its own shape and curvature and marry it somewhat, if you will, to what's there. So that involves some transformation, some manipulation of matching it up. That also means we need to play with the brightness. It means we need to play with the transparency just a bit because it can't be perfectly black. That would be a very stark lighting conditions and that is not the case as you can see with the shadows that are there. Also need to blur it a little bit because it's not a perfect match. There's a little bit of light refraction and reflection around the things around it, and that causes the shadow to distort a little bit. That's why the blur helps with that. Rotoscoping is meant to be a mask. It was just too difficult to work with the edging, uh, the, the shape mask that I had worked with before. So this just gave me the ability to mask out a specific piece and I could see where it was and that worked great. The problem is that with the, the knife, I needed to get rid of part of it it's in the wall. It's embedded in the wall. <laughs> so then there is one more piece of everything here. We've got the throw. We've got the shadow that follows the blade. We've got a shadow that connects when the knife is in the wall. So the last piece of this here really is that I have to show or suggest that the knife is actually embedded in the wall. It's not enough for me to hide part of the shadow, part of the blade and do that. What I need to do is actually put a cut line in there, which is what this is. And this is just a simple straight line that shows the blade has actually entered the wall. I can try to get in a little bit closer here. See that? So you can see how that is literally just a line that is in this case stacked behind, if you will, the objects that I've put there just so it matches up with reality somewhat. <laughs> and a little bit of blur to blend it in a bit. 
um, because it's a distance and it shouldn't be stark perfection of focus, it's away. I'm in focus. This is in the wall that's in the distance, so to speak. The position in zoom is very similar to a transform. It can be used just like a transform in many ways, except it doesn't have rotational control or opacity. It's more of a simplistic move, and I like to use it in place of that sometimes because it scales better, in my opinion. Um, but I didn't need rotation, didn't need any of those things, so I just dropped it in a bit uh, to position it with position and zoom. So those are all the pieces of how we compose the effect with throwing it. And there's another element. There's, there's sound, of course. That's a whole other animal trying to make it convincing of the movement and connecting with the wall. What I did is I broke this down using sequences along the left here um, to get into things. And the sound design, that's just what I just said. You're, you're matching up appropriate things to what goes on and selling it. One other thing I did do here, though, which I'll mention because it's in this track, is I added kind of a rumble of things. I kind of felt like it would make sense if I just threw something with that much force against the wall that the camera may have felt it through the floor, through the walls. So I added a little post-camera shake using a transform, rotating a degree to the right, to the left, and I had to zoom in just a hair. A little, just about 3% to get this so you wouldn't notice the black edges around and then return back to normal by the end. This is a very quick four frame thing that just it's suggesting and helping to sell the impact of the blade connecting with reality, even though it's not there. The rest, as I mentioned, is just sound. Without sound, it's not very real, even with all these things. So do pay attention to sound, find good quality sound effects. And when you get all the pieces together, it can look something like this. So that's really the deal. This was a proof of concept to see if you could actually get this kind of action sequence and work with it um, in Kden Live. It has a lot of untapped potential, in my opinion, for ideas like this, that with just with just a little bit of knowledge for how the effects work and combining their, their effects, making a synergy out of it, you can get some really awesome, realistic things. So I hope this helps spark some ideas and some inspiration. Please do give me a thumbs up if it was helpful and useful to you. Also subscribe if you haven't done that already and leave a comment ask a question, let me know what kind of visual effects and challenges you'd like to get into because it's just fun to figure out how far you can push into this tool and see what you can make it do. I'll see you at the next video. Thank you so much for spending your time with me. I love y'all.